हेलो एंड वेलकम टू डेली न्यूज सिंप्लीफाइड एन आंसर टू व्हाट व्हाई एंड हाउ ऑफ न्यूज़पेपर एनालिसिस फ्रॉम द पर्सपेक्टिव ऑफ यूपीएससी एग्जामिनेशन नाउ हियर वी विल टेक अप न्यूज एंड आर्टिकल्स फ्रॉम द हिंदू एंड इंडियन एक्सप्रेस न्यूज़पेपर डेटेड sorry for interruption here we will take up important news and article featured in the hindu and indian express new delhi edition so we will segregate this discussion into two parts in first part we will discuss important news from the perspective of prelims examination where we will cover topic of global gender gap index we will cover important tiger reserves and wildlife sanctuary located in the state of arunachal pradesh thirdly we will cover a newly launched protocol to manage malnutrition and fourthly we will cover the topic of nobel prize in economics from the mains perspective we will be covering three news first would be electoral bonds second would be geopolitics of west asia because of this israel and hamas conflict thirdly we will cover mg narega and various issues related to it so let's begin our discussion so the first news article which we have taken up for the prelims perspective is this that women want change society needs change this news article featured on page number 6 of the hindu newspaper now as you know in month of june gender gap index of the world economic forum came and it highlighted how much still is to be done to fill the gender gap in entire world so author of this article has taken facts and data from that report and has related it to recently announced the women reservation bill and author has shed light on the issue like uh, gender gap and also on the issue that how this bill will help in filling that gap from your gs perspective is uh, social issues as mentioned in gs paper 2 are important apart from this upsc has been persistently asking question based on important reports and indexes as you all know so we will be covering important aspect of this report like facts and da data which are related to india and facts and data which are related to world which may come handy while writing your answers so let's begin our discussion so this discussion this this part of discussion will mainly cover the facts and data uh, no need for analysis as such in this part a main aim is to provide you with facts and data so that you can enrich your gs answer and essay further from the prelims perspective the basic information which is required has been provided much more detailed facts and data is also provided in the pdf for which the link has been provided in the description box so first is what is global gender gap index it is a annual report which highlights the current state and evolution of gender parity further it was first in it was first introduced by the world economic forum in the year 2006 and according to the estimates the wef has to say that with the current pace of events it will at least take 131 years to fill the gender gap and situation is even more grave for the southeast asian country according to wef southeast asian countries will take 149 years to fill this gap further it says that no country has yet achieved full gender parity and for the 14th year running iceland with 91.2% takes the top position so no country in the world has achieved the gender parity the requisite state of gender parity further for the 146 countries the health and survival gender gap has closed by 
which is a big number. The educational attainment gap by 95.2%, which is again encouraging. Economic participation and opportunity gap by 60.1%, which is on a lower side. Further, the lowest is the political empowerment, which stands at around 22.1% only. Now, status of uh, South Asia and India in the Global Gender Index. Now, India was ranked 127 among 146 countries, which is an improvement because last year, India was ranked 135th. So, there is an improvement of 8 places. Further, the report highlights that India has closed 64.3% of overall gender gap. And considering the state of affairs in India, it is a good number, reasonably good number. However, India has only reached 36.7% parity in economic participation and opportunity. So, as you saw that at global level also, this figure is very low. So, is the case with India. One encouraging fact is that India has achieved parity in enrollment across all levels of education. So, this is one encouraging finding in this report. So, let's, as we discussed that UPSC has been asking questions, you can see here in 2017, UPSC has asked question based on this index only. So, now you can easily answer that which authority publishes this? Answer is World Economic Forum, that is A. Now, take few seconds to read the practice MCQ and try to give your answers in the comment box. Question says, with reference to Global Gender Index 2023 report, consider the following statement. Statement 1 says, it is an annual report published by World Bank, which is incorrect. Statement 2 says, Iceland is the only nation to have full gender parity, which is again incorrect because no country in the world has achieved that. Thirdly, India has improved its ranking by 8 positions compared to previous year, which is a correct statement. So, question is how many of the statements given above are correct? Your answer would be A, that is only one. So, let's move on to the next part of discussion. Now, next news, the inspiration for next news comes from this article which featured in Indian Express newspaper. Now, in this article, a group of scientists have had gone to state of Arunachal Pradesh and with the help of local, they uh, explored the flora and fauna of the state of Arunachal Pradesh. And in this article, they have documented their findings regarding various tiger reserves and wildlife sanctuary. Now, in general, you know the issues related to environment and map location re related to important places in news are important from the perspective of UPSC examination as well as your GS paper 1 syllabus clearly mentions part, uh, topics related to environment and awareness regarding the same. So, here in this discussion, we will be covering the tiger reserves which are mentioned in this particular news, details related to it, then we will look into one PYQ and the practice question. So, the first tiger reserve is Kamlang. Now, in this map, you can find that Kamlang tiger reserve lies at, you, uh, you can say, eastern part of Arunachal Pradesh. Now, it is located in the Lohit district. Kamlang river passes and that is why the name through the sanctuary after which this tiger reserve is named. Local inhabitants of the regions are Mishmi, Digaru and Mizo, home of the four big cats. Now, this is an important fact. It is the only tiger reserve in India which boasts the population of all the big four cats. Um, not all, four big, uh, four big cats, excluding lion. It has tiger, 
the uh, the ordinary leopard clouded leopard snow leopard apart from that it also has population of hello gibbon flo loris leopard cat and himalayan palm civet the next description is related to namdafa tiger reserve and locating the map it is in the south eastern corner of the arunachal pradesh and it is located on dafa bum range of mishmi hills and patkai range in arunachal pradesh near international border with myanmar as you can see here in location the noa dehing river crosses it from east to west it is a biodiversity hotspot in eastern himalaya now it harbors northernmost lowland evergreen rainforest in the world beyond which you cannot find evergreen rainforests namdafa flying is squirrel which is a very important species and critically endangered are endemic to this place that makes this part very important and upsc has asked question based on namdafa reserve itself further the next location is pakke tiger reserve which is located in the foothills of eastern himalayas in the east kamang district of arunachal pradesh you can locate it here it is just above the tezpur in assam and uh, located in the western margins of the arunachal pradesh it is also called pakhui and if you can recall upsc has asked question based on this reserve itself secondly it forms a transition zone between indian and malayan eco regions and high endemicity pakke river forms the boundary in the east while Kameng River forms the boundary in the west. Further, Pakke along with Nameri Tiger Reserve forms one of the largest blocks of semi evergreen and evergreen forest in the northeast. Key habitants are clouded leopard, wild dog, Asiatic jackal and Assamese macaque. Another important wildlife sanctuary which uh, government is planning to convert it into a tiger reserve is Dibang Wildlife Sanctuary. Endangered endangered species like uh, Mishmi takin, Asiatic black bear, musk deer and blith tragopan are found here. So let let's take up the today's practice MCQ. Now before moving to the practice MCQ as i told that upsc has asked a question based on pakhoi wildlife sanctuary in the year 2018 so now you know where it is located it is located in the state of arunachal pradesh now take few seconds to read the practice question and try to give their your answer in the comment box question is consider the following statements statement 1 says kamlang tiger reserve is in assam second it is the only tiger reserve in india that hosts four big cats so now as you know that it is located in the state of arunachal so statement 1 is incorrect while statement 2 is correct that it hosts the population of tiger normal leopard clouded leopard and snow leopard so statement 2 is correct so your answer would be b that is only 2 now the next news again featured in the indian express newspaper which talks about recent launch of protocol to manage mal malnutrition in children now now this protocol is launched by union ministry of women and child development in collaboration with ministry of health and Ve family welfare and ministry of ayush so it is a collaborative effort of three ministries and it is important from the perspective of gs2 syllabus of social justice along with that important schemes and protocols are always important for the examination purpose now again these protocols and these steps may not be that important so you can just go through them that what are the highlights what are the changes they have brought and 
try to figure some key uh, arguments or key findings in these protocols so that you can enrich your answer. So let's take them one by one. So first and foremost important thing that this protocol has changed is that previously severe acute malnutrition, that is SAM, treatment was confined to healthcare facilities. But now this national protocol has been introduced which enables identification and management of malnutrition children at the Angadwadi Anganwadi level itself, okay, covering referral decisions, nutritional care and follow-up also. So, earlier it was at the level of healthcare facilities, now at Anganwadi level itself it will be done. Everything including referral decision, nutritional care and follow-up also. Further, it provides a detailed 10-step guidelines for identification and management of malnutrition children at the Anganwadi level. The guidelines include growth monitoring, appetite testing, nutritional management of malnutrition children and follow-up care of children who manage to achieve requisite growth parameters after intervention. It also includes unique initiatives like Buddy Mother. Now, this is a very important concept. Now, buddy mother concept which was first used in the state of Assam. Now, under this scheme, the mother of a healthy baby guides the mother of a malnutrition, mal, malnourished child at an Anganwadi center every week. So, an experienced, experienced mother helps a mother who is facing, facing challenge of a malnourished child. So, the term the buddy mother. According to the protocol, the severely acute malnutrition children with medical complications and presence of bilateral pitting edema or failed appetite test will be enrolled in the NRC. Now, this is Nutrition Rehabilitation Center. Okay. Now, every SAM child who passes the appetite test and all severely underweight children shall be screened by the medical officer of primary health center within 3 to 5 days of test to identify any health issues, hidden infection or danger sign. Further, children with any medical complication should be referred to the nearest health facility for medical management and further treatment of sickness. So, that was all regarding the, this protocol. Let us move on to the next uh, news article which was based on the Nobel Prize in Economics. Now, this lady, Ms. Claudia Golden, has won the Nobel Prize in Economy for her work in which she has established a correlation between state of economy and the labor force participation rate of women. She has tried to find or develop a correlation between uh, the, uh, the state in which a country's economy is and how that state is reflecting into the LFPR of women. So, she devised a U-shaped graph in which she has explained that initially when country is poor, LFPR for women is at higher rate. And when urbanization and social barrier, urbanization process starts, which brings the social barriers, along with that, income of male members increases and female members choose to sit at home. Now, in this phase, the LFPR decreases. And she has correlated it with the industrial growth of industrial industry that this phase is correlated with the growth of industries and during this phase, the LFPR will decline. And after some time, when women are empowered, money is there, now barriers are removed, then their LFPR will start raising, particularly in the services sector. So, this is a U-shaped graph which she has devised based on her studies. 
So let's take up a practice MCQ. Uh, it is not a MCQ, it is assertion reasoning based question. So statement one says that Nobel Prize 2023 in economics winner Goldin has noted that one factor significantly impacting how men were paid versus women was childbirth. Okay. Second statement says, as women had to shoulder more of the parenting responsibilities, once a child was born, they were also punished for this at the work front in terms of a slower rise on the pay scale. So, don't you think the statement as an assertion is correct as well as statement 2 that is reason is an explanation for this statement 1. So, your answer would be A that is both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct and a statement and uh, statement 2 is the correct explanation for the statement 1. Okay. So, that brings an end to our prelims discussion. Let's move on to the topics which are related from the perspective of mains examination. And the first topic is related to the electoral bonds. And this news article featured on page number 1 of the Hindu newspaper. Article is about uh, our CGI has agreed or uh, has decided to hear petition of uh, various groups, uh, basically the Association for Democratic Reform that is ADR, to expedite the hearing on the issue of electoral bond scheme. Now, according to the ADR, problems are twofold. First is that this electoral bond scheme violates the right to information of public. Secondly, ADR says that since this bill, this particular bill was passed as a money bill in the year 2017-18. So, again it questions the legality of this bill altogether. So, these are the two major points on which ADR has filed a petition and Chief Justice has agreed to expedite the hearing because 2024 general elections are scheduled and nearing by. As you may know that uh, this case, similar case about the legality of uh, electoral bonds is already in front of seven judge constitutional, uh, constitutional bench. So, apart from that bench, CGI agreed to hear this plea differently. Okay. So, in this discussion, we will be covering various aspects of electoral bond. That what is the background? What was the intent? Why it, uh, it was brought by the government? What are the allegations of these petitioners that uh, problems or limitations? What is the point of view of the government? that why uh, the justification or the arguments that government is providing in favor of this bill, uh, this scheme. And then we will look into the possible solution in this issue. If you will look into your GS paper 2 syllabus, the salient feature of representation of people act has been mentioned. Further, Parliament and state legislatures structure functioning conduct of business, powers, privileges and issues arising out of these is also mentioned. So, as the question is about the legality itself, the method of uh, passage of this scheme, so the functioning of parliament comes in question. Apart from this, this scheme has uh, brought amendments to the representation of people act also. So, that makes your RPA part also important. So, let's begin our discussion. So, let us start with the basics, uh, background of this scheme. So, as you all know, union budget of 2017-18, it was then when union government announced its intention to bring the electoral bond scheme 
and it simply says that it wants to cleanse the political funding of of the arena of indian democracy there were cash instances of misuse of cash uh, you might have heard about the news is related to seizer of cash liquor and all those things so government said that it was its intention that it want to clean the political funding scenario of indian democratic setup and bringing this it brought several amendments amendment number 1 that is representation of people act 1951 and what was the amendment we will cover subsequently secondly it brought amendment in the it act of 1961 it also brought a finance act of 2017 further it amended rbi act of 1934 along with amending the fcra okay so what what uh, what was electoral bond scheme uh, why there was a need to bring this scheme what was the procedure earlier and uh, what were the lacuna you may say demerits of those procedures which initiated or which instigated the need for bringing electoral bond scheme so earlier what used to happen suppose there is a person a now one wants to donate a political party some fund because of his or her political leaning so earlier what one would do that just giving cash to the political party that's it now what is the problem what is the problem in giving cash if intention is no uh, if intention is fine there is no problem but this route was being uh, was exploited by several elements in the society what started happening that this became a channel for money laundering okay converting black money to white money there was no accounting you can simply go and give cash to the party and your job is done second problem was now suppose this person has a leaning towards party a and gave the donation to that party but now party b came to the power and they know that this fellow donated to party a uh, party a now he or she will become victim of the party in power so to maintain the anonymity of the donor plus to channelize or to contain the menace of this cash flow government brought up electoral bond scheme and what happened then now again a person if wants to donate a political party certain amount there is a bank in between them acting as an intermediary so now this person will go to the bank will ask for a certain amount of electoral bond bank will take the money will release the bond now bank will give this bond to this pro, uh, this political party without revealing the identity of the person so anonymity aspect covered the cash aspect now because you are going through bank channels there are regulations that transaction would be done only through checks or digital platforms so rotating money rotating black money or laundering money becomes difficult because everything is accounted now now it seems that everything is fine then what is the problem what are the accusation because here there are certain arguments but what is the problem here anonymity issue is solved and the regulation issue is also solved the problem lies in the arguments of the petitioner now petitioner say that while government is claiming that it has brought the uh, it has saved the identity 
and uh, made the process transparent, it is not the reality. And they have provided various arguments in favor of their accusation. They say that it brought opacity in the political funding. How? Now, as you can recall, we talked about various amendments. Now, we will cover them one by one. It says that it keeps public away from the information. Now, these, uh, now they accuse that certain provisions of this scheme have made an hedge around political party. So, claiming to bring transparency, they have brought opacity. How? By amending RPA Act. Now, according to RPA Act, any donation above 20,000 rupees was to be disclosed. Okay? Now, with the Finance Act of 2017, this provision is gone. Now, there is no need to provide any detail to anyone about your finances or the donations. Secondly, there was a legal provision under IT Act. As you can recall, IT Act is also amended. So, the legal provision to disclose the return and taxes is also gone after this amendment. Now, you don't need to provide any return details about return and collection. So, basically they are saying that in name of transparency, you have provided hedging so that they can, they can withhold the information from public domain. Secondly, earlier the cap was on 7.5% of the profit of a company. A company can donate at max the 7.5% of their profit. Now, this cap is also done away. And company can donate any amount, whatever it, uh, whatever it wants. So, a company can donate 100% of its profit also. Now, just imagine a company or an entrepreneur working day and night to make profit and donating 100% to a political party. Now, what according to you? What is it? It is a philanthropy? No. Whose company is this? This is company of a political party, party itself. It, it, it opens the path for creating shell companies. It opens creating path for the shell companies because further these amendments as, as you learned about FCRA, now the foreign funding is also allowed. Any foreign company which has a major stake in domestic company can donate any amount. So all you have to do, you have to create a shell company in a tax haven and you can rewrote whatever amount of money you want to a, uh, to a political party. And these are the accusations uh, based on which the petitions have been filed. Another accusation is that the entire scheme favors the ruling party. How? As while discussing this diagram, if you can recall, we said that uh, bank will not reveal the identity to the party. Now, just imagine a scenario. You all might know that all the nationalized banks are uh, owned by the government. Now, just imagine a situation. Finance ministry is their nodal ministry. Just imagine a situation where a phone call from a finance ministry to a bank official asking details about the donor. Do you think that this will be withheld and the officer will say no in revealing the identity. And government itself is saying that it has all the record of the transaction. So, in future when an investigative agency wants to uh, bring out or to find the data related to transaction, they can tra uh, trace it back. So, it is openly available to anyone. 
so as the nodal agency in this case sbi is government owned so the petitioners are saying that there is no way that anonymity will be maintained and these allegations are not baseless if you will look into some facts and data in 2019 itself within 2 months sbi released around 1716 crore worth of 1716 crore worth of electoral electoral bonds were released within 2 months and during 2017 and 18 almost 95% of it went to the ruling party so allegations are not baseless and gravity of situation depends further if you will look into the eci's stand that is election commission of india which ha which also showed its displeasure regarding various provision first is that it will not allow eci to check violation of provisions in the representation of people act as you know that finance act has taken away all the scrutiny from the purview of public domain including eci so now eci cannot ask for details further eci has a stand has a stand that amendment to fcra which allows foreign countries to donate uh, whatever amount they want will influence the policy matter in india because they are the funder now and eci has absolutely no control over it leave alone the control they won't be having any information regarding this so these are the concern raised by eci in its affidavit now it is very important to know the government's argument which are which which must be uh, which must be listen so let us discuss them one by one government argument is first that it has limited the use of cash in political funding which is true because uh, there were several news of cash being used cash cash being distributed and etc but now they have limited and so the intention or aim to curb that menace is quite reasonable secondly government says that it has curbed the black money it has intention to curb the black money how they are saying that since the kv kyc norms are to be followed strictly and since the transfer of cash would be through checks dd or online digital platform so there would be a cons consistent check over the transaction and who uh, through the source of the transaction and the legitimacy of the money etc further it says that it protects donor from political victimization by maintaining the anonymity okay fine but this anonymity will be maintained until and unless government decides otherwise as you know that they can easily take out any information from the bank itself so as per the government they want to protect the donor from political victimization because earlier when an opposing party knows that you have uh, given donation to that party and if that party comes to power they will victimize you for your deeds further for foreign funding government says it has sufficient safeguards as the first condition is Uh, that foreign country that can donate is to have majority stake in indian company secondly it must also fulfill the kyc norms so government is saying there is ample safeguards so no need to worry further a very good intention indeed is the elimination of fraudulent political parties now there were several political parties who were exist uh, who were just there to do the black and white business so you will donate some amount as a political funding and your money is just in the circulation of the economy in all good manner 
so it will eliminate those parties who were living in the, uh, on this business only so these were the arguments of the government and case is with supreme court with seven seven uh, judge bench so let us wait for the final decision and we will take this discussion then also when the verdict uh, verdict comes so what would be the way forward now the suggestions are uh, suggestions include that switching to complete digital transaction there should be no dd and check system also complete digital transaction should be there second donations above a certain limit should be made public to break the corporate political nexus thirdly political parties should be brought under the ambit of rti fourthly establish a national electoral fund where donors contribute and funds are distributed among different parties so these are the way forwards which you can use in your answer writing as a suggestion so let's move on to the next topic of our mains discussion which is related to the most troubling news that we are hearing on a daily basis is a conflict between israel and hamas news appeared in both the newspaper uh, indian express and the hindu so we and they touched upon different aspect so here we try to kind of assimilate all the discussions in one uh, taking references from both the newspapers while uh, the hindu talks about the genesis and nitty gritty is related to uh, origin and development of hamas indian express has delve upon a very important issue that what would be the stand of india in such scenario and what is the geopolitical scenario altogether in the in the region of conflict so we have tried to cover both the aspects as uh, international uh, your ir syllabus clearly mentions about bilateral regional and global groupings and india is involved in various groupings in this area and uh, further effects of policies and politics of developed and developing countries on india's interest which is also important from the perspective of upsc examination so let us begin our discussion now if you want to cover the dimensions of palestine and israel conflict you can refer to daily news analysis session of 9th october taken by webho sir he has covered the entire dimension and the various facts related facts and facets related to israel palestine conflict so you can refer to understand this here in this discussion we will be looking at what is hamas what is plo uh, what are the key players in the region what are their groupings what are the leanings and in this uh, multipolar world uh, what is the standing of usa what is the standing of china what is the standing of india and why uh, there is a change in the approach of india okay so first what is hamas you can trace the origin of hamas in the islamic brotherhood which uh, in uh, which started in the in egypt by egyptian islamist hasan al banna in the year 1928 now it was uh, not any extremist organization or uh, it did not sort it it did not sort to any extreme activities to achieve their goals rather it was a reorientation they were of the belief that they need to first strengthen the islamic community and then talk about something else but the iranian revolution of 1979 changed everything now after this revolution what happened that each and every such grouping started 
uh, started to aspire for uh, getting a grab over the political power, including this brotherhood, which we are talking about. And in that aspiration, Hamas was established after the first intifada, which means the uprising. in the year 1987. Now this brotherhood asked Palestinians to stand up against the Israeli occupation. Now they started taking extremist approach, proactive approach. Following the second intifada that is uprising, the acceptability of Hamas increased many fold. Now, in the following elections, Hamas defeated PLO, about which we will talk subsequently, in the year 2006. And presently, Hamas, now uh, after winning the election, Hamas formed the government. And presently, what is the situation that Hamas faction is in control of the Gaza? while the PLO faction is in control of the West Bank. And that is why, that is why you are hearing the news that Israel is pounding Gaza. Because Hamas has lost the, launched the attack on Israel. So, more often than not, you will read the news that Gaza was pounded, rocket are, uh, rocket are, uh, rockets are coming from Gaza, because it is a conflict between Hamas and Israel. So, what is PLO? Now, PLO was founded in 1964 and they believed in the guerrilla tactics and they uh, came out with a national movement in Palestine. They championed the, they championed the cause of the Palestinian. If you can recall, Mr. Yasser Arafat was leader of PLO, a renowned figure in global politics. Now, it is represented by Fateh political party, which is dominant in West Bank region. Why West Bank? Because it lies in the, uh, to the west of River Jordan. Okay, and this is the Gaza, which is, uh, dom uh, in Gaza, the Hamas is the dominant political party. Okay. So, now, why there is a fissure in Arab world and it is always in news. So, to understand this, you must understand that there are three major powers in mid, mid, uh, West Asia or Middle East, whatever you can call it. First is Sunni. Now, the Sunni Muslims are led by Saudi Arabia. And it is the, uh, it is, if, if you will talk about all the factions in uh, this region, this is the economically most prosperous faction. It is backed, uh, led by Saudi and uh, have, has uh, various allies and they together form the Gulf Cooperation Council the GCC. Now the second faction is Shia faction. Now leader for this faction is Iran. And Iran has now developed an aspiration to gain a, uh, gain a status of world leader for Islamic country. But right now, the position is, it is more of a leader of Shia faction. And you might have heard about the term Hezbollah, another militant group, uh, which is uh, these days located in uh, South Lebanon, is backed by Iran. So, Iran is the leader of Shia faction. Now, the third dominant player is Israel or Jews. Anything?
now you know three factions but conflict is not limited to these three only you will often uh, you will uh, you will often hear the news that britain said this usa said this china said this russia said this so this uh, sunni backed uh, sunni faction is backed by usa usa is the security provider it has acted as a security provider to this faction now what is who is providing uh, who is providing assistance to shia faction of lately it is china and why because there was a persistent tussle between us and iran and for the obvious reasons now under the sanctions iran felt secluded and sided by all these arab countries now china being an oil importing economy oil oil dependent economy wanted to place itself or uh, wanted to get into the affairs of west asia so who could be a better option other than iran so china started investing in iran through its belt and road initiative fine another faction israel you all know backed by west europe entire entirely and us now what happened situation changed learning from uh, their experience in afghanistan and iran usa try, now uh, tried to withdraw uh, withdraw itself from this region but it also wants to maintain its presence through its allies why because china is coming so to counter china usa wants its presence without putting foot on soil so what it is doing abraham accord between uh, uae israel okay so abraham accord was concluded just to bring them together and another big power there 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 is a similar a similar accord on cards with reference to saudi arabia and israel so what us wants to do us wants to collect or to strengthen its allies by bringing them closure so uh, usa is brokering a deal just to maintain its presence and meanwhile china is backing iran so what is the stand of india in this case so here you can understand this in two parts before 1991 and after 1991 before 1991 in cold war era india was an uh, india was a close ally of ussr so israel was backed by usa so the obvious option was to not to take side of israel so india always maintained that it supports palestinian cause but after 1991 with the fall of ussr the dissolution of ussr opening up of economy israel being a strong technological power economic power and regional power and being an important ally of usa because after 1991 the uh, world became a unipolar thing usa was the only superpower so siding with usa was a prudent decision so in 1991 itself india recognized israel and started establishing its diplomatic relation and now they are one of the closest ally of each other further 
India is also engaging with Saudi Arabia, UAE and other countries in that region. How? Recently, India created a quadrilateral accord of Mid East region which includes India, Israel, UAE and USA, acronym of which is I2, U2. Fine. Secondly, the focus of this group is on establishing close economic and developmental ties in the Middle East region. Again, India is also uh, oil dependent or uh, importing nation. Why uh, another another uh, fact uh, that USA is disengaging uh, from this region is the shale gas revolution. Earlier, they used to import large amount of oils from this region. But now with the shale gas uh, revolution, they don't need it much. So they want to regroup their uh, paraphernalia, which uh, they were engaged in the, uh, in the entire stretch of the region. So they want to regroup it, but they want to maintain the presence. And now India is also expanding. Reasons are two, the interest, economic interest, as well as to counter the China. So it forced a quadrilateral there. Secondly, in recent G20 meet, India led the formation of India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. So, in this map, you can see that this economic corridors includes Saudi Arabia as well as Israel. So, yes, India is in a position where uh, they have to look into the Saudi aspect also as well as Israel aspect also and that is the main uh, issue why India is feeling the heat of the moment that which, uh, which side it wants to take and that silence is being uh, interpreted by different experts in a different manner. However, our Prime Minister has announced that uh, people of India are in solidarity with the people of Israel. So, let us move on to discuss further that why India, India's position is changing. So, first is increasing recognition of Israel by Arab country. You see, uh, you saw Abraham Accord, you, uh, you already know that there is a similar thing on cards with Saudi Arabia also. That and it means that the taboo of having close relation with Israel has been shelved. This has given confidence to India to establish closer relation with Israel. Further, increasing Islamist fundamentalist and terror linkages of Hamas has meant that India has gradually moved away from this group and its methods. As India sees terrorism as a primary threat to its territorial integrity. Now, differences between Hamas and PLO has meant that India has sided with accommodative PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Yasser Arafat was very close to several prime ministers in India. And India has sided with PLO, which is more moderate in its approach. Now, India continues to support two-state solution, which Mr. Arafat uh, has pleased. Now, as PLO has itself recognized Israel and has relations and dialogue with it, India has bandwidth to accommodate the Palestine cause yet have ever close relation with Israel. Because now, both uh, the PLO and India are on the same page. PLO recognizes Israel and so does India. Further, India has been able to engage both Arab countries of UAE, Saudi Arabia and Egypt and yet has closer relation with Israel. Now this has given confidence to India to shelf tears that uh, uh, relations with the uh, fears that relations with Israel will compromise India's energy security and its interest of diaspora who are employed in these countries. Okay. Now India's increasing closer relation with the Western Bloc and USA in particular has brought uh, brought uh, led to India to end its traditional resistance toward this block. Okay, 
since israel was closer to the western bloc india's resistance towards israel was partly fed by india's anti west orientation during the cold war so most of the reasons that we have already discussed we have just compiled it for your note making process so that uh, you can use them as a reason that why uh, why india is changing its position and what are the interest of india in this geopolitical scenario that brings us to the last topic of today's discussion which was featured in the indian express newspaper and news is about discrepancies in the mg narega which are found uh, the irregularities and discrepancies which are found in state of bengal now the report says that these are not limited to state of bengal only they have far reaching impact they are, there are many states which are reporting such irregularities so in this discussion we will be discussing the benefits of manrega uh, the challenges that manrega faces uh the scheme faces and uh, the way ahead uh, uh, what what uh, what the government is doing to address all these issues as covered in this news article also referring to your syllabus your gs paper 2 syllabus clearly mentions government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation so interventions in the field of employment so this uh, this topic you can relate it to this part of the syllabus and if you will look into the syllabus of upsc uh, sorry previous year question of upsc in 2017 question has been asked that poverty alleviation programs in india remain mere show pieces until and unless they are backed by political will discuss with reference to the performance of the major poverty alleviation programs in india okay so so let's begin our discussion on manrega and issues related to it so why do we need such programs is it the first program of this kind why there is need to address the poverty itself is a biggest question and answer lies in the numbers and they are big if you will refer global multi dimensional poverty index 2023 it says india still has more than 230 million people who are poor what is 230 million that is out of 125 crore around 23 crore people are poor secondly tendulkar committee estimates that around 22% of the country's population is poor so in numbers you can uh, imagine that roughly around 30 crore people are lying below poverty line and don't forget these are just estimation of poverty uh, which which uh, sits in the bracket of rupees 300 to 400 per day don't you think this is not the sufficient even if someone is earning 400 per day it is not a sufficient amount for a, a meaningful life leave alone the 1000 rupees per day or other aspects so this is also a conservative approach to calculate and even with this approach we are having around 30 crore people who are living below poverty line and one of the major factor which contributes to the poverty is the lack of employment now how do you generate the employment simple answer lies in uh, economic growth or uh, creation of jobs through skill development or uh, result of economic growth industry all these processes will take a long time they have a long gestation period government has uh, government realized that they have to do something directly to create employment economic growth will do but it will take time 
so government took matters in their hand so do you think government just woke up in 2010 and brought this scheme before that they were not thinking about it answer is no there were several schemes like integrated rural development program jawahar rozgar yojana and jawahar gram samriddhi yojana sampurna gramin rozgar yojana these were the schemes which were launched just to address the issue of poverty and employment but they failed miserably because of several structural reasons sometime what happened some i am enlisting the details of these reasons i have been provided in the pdf itself where they struggle they struggled in the matters of funds sometime funds were not allocated properly without any research funds were allocated haphazardly sometime funds were not reaching at time just delaying the process sometime what happened the planning process itself was flawed the one size fits all strategy the coverage was not good to an extent that only 5% of indian villages were covered by these schemes such was the coverage sometime what happened the planning uh, the planning process itself did not include the stakeholders they were only included at the execution level so all these issues all these factors combined and they resulted into failure of these schemes so the government uh, government realized that there is a need of complete rehaul a complete overhaul a transformation a new thing and then came the mahatma gandhi national rural employment guarantee act mg narega with a promise with an assurance of 100 days work to rural households now what was unique with this it came with a guarantee it came with a guarantee that you will be provided 100 days of work no matter what you just have to approach the sarpanch and government will make sure that you will get the job that was a guarantee so right uh, the employment was recognized as a legal right for the first time by the government itself okay that it is a matter of right it is not matter of choice so the use of the word guarantee itself was a big thing fine so when when it was launched uh, it has been praised on various platforms uh, globally also uh, nationally also globally also so let us quickly look into the benefits of mg narega which includes the first and foremost the poverty and unemployment reduction how directly through uh, transferring and providing money against the work so you are empowering someone by providing them uh, some money against the work they have put in indirectly what it brought that studies have found that money that people have earned through manrega they have spent more than 50% of it in food articles in food articles in nutrition which addressed the issue of malnutrition in rural area further when a jobless person just imagine a jobless person now with a guarantee of work from the government and getting good remuneration now the person has a bargaining power because he is earning he has he or she has a secured earning now he or she can bargain for other works if a 
agricultural landlord reaches approaches them that uh, please do 2 3 days work in my field now the landlord will not be the person who will dictate the terms the laborers can ask for the money they want for the work okay so it gave them the bargaining power also okay further the second point the vulnerable section upliftment yes it happened because the provisions of this scheme talks about giving primacy to scheduled caste scheduled tribe and women now these are the vulnerable section giving primacy with the backing of government will surely uplift their stature and in some cases the 15% of the household income is from mg narega only okay thirdly migration reduction now if a person just imagine a person who is getting job at his or her native place what would be the choice to remain there to work there in the comfort of their home environment so the backward areas from where there was a distressed migration because most of the time the uh, these uh, this class of uh, unprivileged underprivileged people Uh, their migration was not by choice it was just to avoid their death so it was the distress migration so instances are there where uh, this migration has uh, witnessed a huge fall in number now people are preferring to stay back home and doing work further as you all know the mg narega has a fe uh, has a feature of creating asset and what are the benefits it has economic benefits which includes the agriculture productivity how through the development of wasteland fallow land and construction of post harvest storage facilities and work sheds now these infrastructures are acting as a complementary factor for the agriculture sector further there is a significant reduction in water vulnerability index so the tanks the reservoirs are made where uh, waters are stored for the lean period and they are helpful in mitigating the crisis during the drought period so water vulnerability index has come down agricultural vulnerability is also addressed to a large extent not completely but to a large extent and livelihood vulnerability also mg narega has also had a multiplier effect how just as i discussed in the first point that money that you are earning you are investing in food articles and where would you get the food from where you would get the articles from you will buy the products which are being product produced locally so it becomes a cycle in which one investment is re complementing or uh, complementing or reinforcing or encouraging the other sector to grow also because you you are spending your earning in uh, locally produced good uh, the food articles the uh, the daily uses thing so it has a multiplier effect on the rural economy altogether and as you have seen that uh, agriculture productivity has increased due to infrastructure so the infrastructure itself is a merit so it has uh, it it has helped in creating rural assets and infrastructures like playgrounds crematorium okay uh, anganwadis schools uh, school complexes and several thing so if everything is, uh, is that fine so what is the problem and uh, problem has been highlighted by none other than but the arc itself 
the administrative reform commission they have raised several issues with manrega we will take up them uh, we will take them up one by one first is the guarantee and the convergence issue i stressed on the word guarantee at the beginning now this guarantee has become a problem in itself now you have made a promise you have kind of uh, universalized the process that okay i will give job to everyone who wants which is not practically possible because during planning what you skipped is the agro cycle of india and you know that india is an agrarian economy so you skipped the agro cycle what is it you prepare the field okay for agriculture uh, you prepare the field for the next uh, har uh, next sowing process you sow the seeds done now for 2 to 3 months what would you do you will be maintaining the irrigation works the uh, work that that's all so now the plan of manarega is not in sync with this agro cycle so what happens when work is there laborers are not there they are engaged in uh, farmlands their farmlands or others farmland and uh, there are situations when there is no work and there is huge catch a of laborers who are ready to work but there is no work at all so uh, this lack of coherence between the agro cycle and the plan is creating the problem second is the convergence issue what is convergence there are several similar schemes with similar aims and similar target groups you can take example of pradhan mantri awas yojana same target group and same aim to empower the vulnerable section now this is nothing but duplication of effort you are putting all your machinery all your uh, money all your uh, apparatus in uh, in doing similar th uh, similar things okay so that creates a confusion also and that also results into duplication of effort second is which is very uh, very important issue is this the funding is done by the union but the execution is done by the state government now here the problem is twofold again why now if central and state government is same everything is smooth everything is fine but the situation where central and state government are different maintaining that cordial relation to uh, keep the wheel spinning smoothly becomes a difficult uh, difficult job because funding agency is different executing agency is different further if things will go south by that i mean if things uh, are not on the mark or they just uh, get ruined who will be uh, who will be held accountable the state government will say they are not sending the fund they will say we have sent the fund they are not executing the work so there is issue of accountability also and sorry and maintaining that coherence is also a challenge the next challenge is centrality of local government now you have given the task of uh, smooth execution of mg narega to uh, pris panchayati raj institution and every upsc aspirant know that there is always a probable question about challenges faced by pri itself so you have given a thick body a responsibility to take care of a new juvenile um, juvenile you can say or a newborn so you are burdening pri without strength, strengthening the pri you are not ready to devolve powers to pri but you are ready to give responsibilities to pri so that is another issue okay 
Fourth is the administrative and institutional arrangement altogether, which results in the leakages, various leakages. There are instances where there is a syndicate of contractors uh, providing wrong musters and uh, muster rules, and uh, there are issues of uh, uh, transparency also, where the exclusion and inclusion errors are persistent so these are some structural changes uh, uh, challenges sorry now very important issue is issue related to wages okay now what is, what is the issue first issue is that wages for narega is dis, uh, determined by the center now every state has uh, their own set of minimum uh, wage as per their geography, economy, socio-economic structure, their capability and all. And most of the time, this wage that has been decided by the center is not in sync with uh, what has been decided by the state. So, state accuse center that they are burdening us with uh, declaring higher amount. So, they often demand the parity in rates. Second issue is that the uh, wages itself are based on the PPI, agricultural labor. There are several indices like CPI, WPI, CPI industrial worker, you might know. So, it calculates the wages on the basis of CPI, agricultural labor. What happens? It is not that comprehensive in dice. So, what happens? The, uh, the wages that are determined do not capture the real picture of inflation. So, that becomes a problem. Further, as we discussed earlier, uh, earlier that if there is not sync, there are several instances where uh, Supreme Court has to intervene to ask center to release funds for the wages. Because if there is any tussle, center will stop, stop the funding. Okay. Now, the next thing, as we discussed that it, gave bar, it gives bargaining power, so it has a flip side also. It reduces the availability of agricultural and industrial labor altogether. Okay. Because now, since you are getting a, a fixed job, and uh, you are not ready to work in the agricultural field. And if you can re recall, recently there has been instances where uh, laborers have refused to go to the green, uh, uh, this uh, green belt of uh, agriculture in Western UP and uh, green revolution belt, Western UP, Punjab and Haryana, and which resulted into uh, the inflation, food inflation, prices going up. Just because laborers are not ready to go. So, on one hand, it gives them, uh, empowers them by giving them bargaining power. On the other hand, this bargaining power proves uh, detrimental for agricultural sector also. Thirdly, a recent CAG report highlighted a very striking discovery that only 51% of panchayats had been, uh, had conducted the social audit which is 50%, uh, obviously, which is half of what is intended. So, these are the challenges and issues which are uh, highlighted by the ARC. Now, quickly look into the steps taken by the government and you can quote them uh, in your answer as it is, that what steps that government has taken. So, first is, for transparency and implementation, government has brought management information system, uh, kind of uh, real-time information about what work is going on, where work is going on, to, uh, to, uh, to manage the leakages and frauds. Social audit, which you saw, only 51% was covered. There is uh, provision of district-level ombudsman also. Now, there are procedures of uploading three photographs of whatever work is going on. So, in this way, they are maintaining the transparency of execution of work. 
फर्दर गवर्नमेंट इज ट्राइंग टू ट्राइंग टू ब्रिंग प्रोफेशनल स्टाफ एट द ग्राम पंचायत लेवल टू ब्रिंग मोर एफिशियंसी एंड मोर फोकस्ड वर्क फर्दर एम जी नरेगा ऑडिट्स ऑफ स्कीम्स रूल्स हैव बीन ब्रॉट नाउ फोकस ऑन आई ए पी डिस्ट्रिक्ट गवर्नमेंट इज पुटिंग फोकस ऑन आई ए पी डिस्ट्रिक्ट वॉट इज इट इंटीग्रेटेड एक्शन प्लान बेसिकली द बैकवर्ड एरियाज to lay special special focus on backward areas now uh, the in the list of works government has added 30 new works that uh, employment can be given in these uh, these fields also okay another software that government has brought is narega soft uh, which uh, basically uh, keeps a real time tab on the progress of work data can be uploaded pictures can be uploaded can be accessed so uh, it's kind of monetary work and streamlining that uh, linking the scheme with the ski, uh, skill india to prevent recurring of mg narega activities in same areas and uh, government has re uh, recently allowed migration for people and uh, M narega benefits can be linked all across india using aadhar which has come as a respite to the migrant worker and workers all together and lastly government has also started geo tagging the assets what is it you you have to geo tag the asset where where it has been made so that government has an inventory to check upon it so geo tagging can help track the location and development status of uh, say a pond or bridge or any structure that is being made and located in any of india's 6 lakh villages so these are the steps that government has taken many more they need to take so that's all for today's discussion stay tuned for more such updates